Good morning, everyone. Let's stand as we worship together. Faith of our fathers, 404. song got a little ahead of myself there throughout the Travis was had a special song and I ran up here and had to run back down what a beautiful beautiful song and that's what a father does he he raises us up he makes us more than what we're able to be not just our heavenly father but even our earthly fathers uh, do the same as well you have your Bibles and I hope that you do turn with me to first Samuel first Samuel chapter 2 we're going to look at verses 27 uh, through 36. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 27 through 36. Couldn't come up with a catchy title, so I just simply titled it A Father's Day Message. If you have a better title than that, you feel free to share that with me at the end of today's service. Nonetheless, the title don't matter. Uh, what does matter is the text, and that's what we're going to look at. That's what we're going to swim through a little bit today. Um, first of all, I want to wish all the fathers here uh, happy Father's Day. Now, of course, Father's Day doesn't get the hype that Mother's Day uh, gets, but uh, that's okay. I'm fine with that. I'm sure most of you are okay with that as well. Church attendance usually reflects that. Uh, you usually have higher attendance on Mother's Day than you do on Father's Day, but it's good to see we have children of fathers who are here today, and we thank you that you're here. May your Father's Day be a blessed day. In my studies, I came across some rather amazing and interesting facts concerning fathers. Now, I may have shared these with you before. I can't remember, but um, that's okay. It's a good reminder to us uh, the role a father plays in the spirituality of his home. Uh, research has revealed that if a child is the first in the household to come to Christ, so the first in the house to be saved or become a Christian, there is a 3.5% probability that everyone else in the house will become a Christian. That's pretty low, right? Only 3.5% probability that everyone else would come to Christ if a child is the first one to come to Christ. Now, if the mother of the family was to be the first one to accept Christ, the first one in the house to get saved, the percent goes up a little bit to about 17%. So there's a 17% probability of the rest of the home 
uh, will come to Christ if the mother is the first one to be saved. But if the father, the father of the home is the first to accept Christ, there is a 93% probability that everyone else in the household will follow. When a father leads the way spiritually in his home, good things happen at home. All right? I'm not going to say that the opposite is true. I'm not going to say if a father doesn't. But I do want to share a story from the Old Testament about a father who did not spiritually lead his home well. And because he didn't, the outcome was brutal. Not just for him and his home, but his future generations as well. So follow along with me as I read 1 Samuel chapter 2, starting with verse 27, going through verse 36. Verse 27, Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I have committed in my dwelling place, and honor your sons more than me? to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Therefore the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, Far be it from me, for those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming that I will cut off your arm, and the arm of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house. And you will see an enemy in my dwelling place, despite all the good which God does for Israel. And there shall not be an old man in your house forever. But any of your men whom I do not cut off from my altar shall consume your eyes and grieve your heart. And all the descendants of your house shall die in the flower of their age. Now this shall be a sign to you that will come upon your two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die, both of them. And then I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is my heart, what is in my heart and in my mind. I will build him a sure house and shall walk before my anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left in your house will come and will bow down to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread and say, Please put me in one of the priestly positions that I may eat a piece of bread. Let us pray. Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for uh, being a good, good father, being a father that we can call upon, that we can lean on, that we can cry to, that we can have a relationship with. And Lord, I know that not everybody... And a number of this size has had the godliest of influence from a fatherly position. But God, we know and we trust. For your word tells us that you will be the father to the orphans, to the fatherless. And so God, I pray. Lord, if there's any in here who today is just a hard day. Because maybe their father wasn't good to them. God, maybe, maybe they will... Um, May you minister to them that they will lean upon you and build that relationship with you. And God, for those who have had great fathers who have gone on before them, God, may you bless them this day with great memories. Lord, and, and may they remember their legacy this day. And God, I pray for the fathers who are here. God, that you help us to heed your word. God, that we spiritually lead our homes and our families, and those that we are around, may we be a godly influence. God, speak to us today through your word. May you be exalted, and may you be glorified. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. 
Let me set up um, this passage of Scripture that I just read uh, before we dive into what lessons we can learn uh, from Eli as a father. So let me kind of give you a background, a little understanding of what's going on. Uh, 1 Samuel uh, begins with a man named Elkanah, okay? Um, Elkanah has two wives. One of his wives is named Hannah. Hannah uh, so desperately wants to have a child, but she can't. And because of this, the other wife makes fun of Hannah, ridicules Hannah. And so one day, Hannah makes her way to the tabernacle. And so she's there at the tabernacle, and she is weeping for, before God, and she is crying out to God that He would give her a son. And if that He was to give her a son, that, he, that she would give him back to God. Well, Eli, who is the high priest at that time, is an older man, sees Hannah praying or praying. He doesn't know that she's praying at the time. He looks at her, and he thinks that she's drunk. And so he approaches Hannah, and he actually says to Hannah, How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away. See, he thought that she was drunk because she would move her lips, but nothing was coming out of her mouth. And at that point, Hannah told him that she was not drunk. She was just a woman of sorrowful spirit. And then Eli realized at that point of having a conversation with her that she was not drunk. And he said to her, go in peace. God will grant your petition. God will answer your prayer. And God did just that. God answered Hannah's prayer. Hannah was given a son and she named him Samuel. And when he became of age, when he was weaned, she gave him back to God. She brought him to the tabernacle to be under Eli's care. And so Samuel became the understudy of Eli. Now Eli had already had two sons, one named Hophni, the other one named Phinehas. Uh, they too were priests. They were following in their father's footsteps, and they were priests. But these two men, these two sons, were wicked. All right? We're talking about extremely wicked. They did some very evil things with the sacrifices, and they committed adulterous acts at the door of the tabernacle of meetings. These two men, Hophni and Phinehas, Eli's two sons, were a disgrace to Eli. They were a disgrace to God. They were a disgrace to the people of Israel. And they were, they were hated for the most part. They had a godly example, or at least a good example in Eli. Eli was a good man, but they didn't follow after him. A little side note here, guys. Uh, Dad, you can be a good man, all right? And your children still rebel and still go uh, the way of evil. It doesn't matter how good you are. It matters how well you raise them, all right? We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But Eli was a good man, and for the most part, he was a, he was a godly man, all right? But they didn't follow him. And so stories begin to arise throughout Israel about Eli's sons. Now, they too were priests. Eli was the high priest. And so Eli heard these stories, and he began to have... Uh, he, he sat them down to have a conversation with them. And he told them, he says, Guys, you can't be making a mockery of God. If you continue to make a mockery of God, who will intercede for you? Who will come uh, on your behalf before God? So he had this conversation with them, and this talk did no good. His talk with them did after absolutely no good. So after Eli's little talk, his rebellious sons kept on doing what they were doing. And then a man of God, which we pick up in verse 27, comes to Eli. And he tells Eli the fate of his house. If something doesn't change, if you don't straighten out your sons, then your house will be cut off. 
We see that in verse 27 and verse 31. So let's read those just as a reference. Verse 27, Then a man of God, this is the man of God, came to Eli and said, And thus says the Lord, Did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt and Pharaoh's house? Then verse 31, this is, this is the key here. Is, Behold, the days are coming that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house so that there will, be no, there will not be an old man in your house. In other words... The man of God told Eli, Eli, you better get your house in order or I'm going to cut you off. Eli, get your house in order or uh, you're going to be done. That's what he was telling Eli. Well, years went by. Eli's sons did not change, but the boy Samuel, Hannah's son, uh, became and grew uh, in stature and became uh, in favor with God and with man. Samuel was turning out to be a godly man. So God, not happy with Eli, not happy with his sons, wasn't speaking to the children of Israel, wasn't speaking to the priest. But one evening, God spoke to Samuel. You know the story. Samuel didn't know who it was, calling his name, so he runs to Eli, and he says, Eli, what do you want? I'm right here. And of course, Eli finally figured out that it was God trying to speak to Samuel. And so he said, Samuel, respond like this. And so Samuel goes back to bed. God speaks again. Samuel responds the way Eli says. And then God tells Samuel all that was going to happen to Eli and his family and his house. So the next morning, Samuel gets up. He's eating breakfast with Eli. Eli says, well, what did God say? And of course, Samuel's grieved, but Samuel tells him everything that God had said. And Eli told him, he says, surely it was the Lord. It was the Lord who spoke to Samuel. And shortly after that conversation, the Israelite army went into battle with the Philistines. And you can read all of this throughout these first section of 1 Samuel. And so the Israelite army went out to battle the Philistines, and the Philistines defeated Israel. And so the elders of Israel got a little desperate, and they said, well, we've got to take the presence of God. So they took the Ark of the Covenant, and they moved it to the battlefield. And the Philistines were a little taken back at first. They're like, oh, no, what are we going to do? But they decided to keep fighting. And so they, according to the Bible had a great slaughter amongst the Israelites, and they took the Ark of the Covenant. So the Ark of the Covenant was in the possession of the Philistines. I'll let you read what happens to that a little bit later. Now when word got back to Eli about the Ark of the Covenant and how it had been captured, and that his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were both killed the same day in battle, Eli being a rather large man, because he got fat on the Israel's offerings, sat on the wall, sat at his place at the wall, at the gate. When he heard the news, he fell backwards, broke his neck, and died. Of course, you can read the rest of that story. It does get better, not for Eli, not for his family, but it definitely does for Samuel in the Ark of the Covenant. You know that Samuel grew up. He was the one who anointed Saul. He was the one who anointed David. He was a great prophet. Samuel was a great prophet to all of Israel. But when word got back to Eli, he fell over and he died. What a sad but yet intriguing story. And from the life of Eli, as a father, I want to give you four pieces of advice concerning fathers. Real quick, four pieces of advice concerning fathers that we can learn from Eli's mistakes. Number one, number one, uh, praise God more than your kids. Praise God more than you praise your kids. This needs to be pre preached from the rooftops if ever before in any culture. Praise God more than you praise your kids. Look at verse 29. It says, Why do you kick God, or the man of God, speaking to Eli, right? So this is God speaking. Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling place? 
and honor your sons more than me, to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people. And so God says, Eli, why are you praising your sons? Why are you raising your sons up to a higher place than you are me? Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't praise your kids. I don't want you to misunderstand me. I think we ought to encourage our kids. I think we ought to praise our kids. I think that when they do well, we ought to let them know we are proud of them. So don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying we don't praise our kids. We don't um, congratulate or add a boy our kids, okay? But, but if your kids only hear you praising them, then th they'll think that they are God. If your kids only hear you praising them, then they'll think that they're God. Let them see God raised to the highest place in your life, not them. Don't let your kids see you. And it doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter how old your kids are. All right? It's, I'm not speaking to somebody who just had a child. I'm not speaking to anybody who's a father. This applies to me. Right? I got kids. Yes, they're all of adult age, but guess what? I still have to follow these principles as well. Let them see God raised to the highest place of your life. See, in most cases, your kids will worship what they see you worship. In most cases, your kids will worship what they see you worship. If you worship them, then they will worship themselves. Seen that in society, hadn't we? When you worship your kids, they will worship themselves. Your kids will learn more from your everyday actions than when you actually sit them down and have a conversation with them and tell them, son or daughter or whatever, don't do this. Don't do that. Didn't work with Eli, did it? Just sat them down. Listen, kids do as you do, not as you say. Kids do as you do, not as you say. All right? Now, of course, this is just a principle. It's not a promise. Okay? It's just a principle. You don't want your kids to do tobacco products? Then don't do tobacco products. All right? You don't want your kids to curse? Don't curse. You don't want your kids to drink? Don't drink. You don't want your, if you want your kids to go to church, go to church. Instead of telling them, sitting them down and saying, hey, do this or don't do that, how about you do it or don't do it? All right, lead by example, dads. Lead by example. Same goes with prayer. And we're talking about the negative things. What about the positive things? Same go with prayer. You can't depend upon the church. You can't depend upon Sunday school or a Sunday school teacher to teach your kids to pray. You can't do it. Don't. Don't, don't put that responsibility on me to teach your kids how to pray. Because that's not fair to your kids. That's not fair to me. It's not fair to their Sunday school teacher. Well, I bring them to church so they can learn how to pray. Look, you've got to do that at home. You've got to do that at home. See, they learn from you. I remember growing up. And I went to Sunday school every single Sunday. I was in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Anytime the doors were open, I was there. All right? I heard lots of men praying. I heard lots of women praying in church. But the one place I learned to pray was from my dad. I don't know how it is that way, but it just is. I learned how to pray from my dad. Dads, let your children hear you pray. Something happened one Monday a long time ago. I know all the kids will remember this. We homeschooled our kids for a time. And before they would start school, they were younger, uh, we would start the day with prayer. Well, the Sunday before that Monday, I was preaching, and before I preached, I always prayed, kind of like what I do here. And in my prayer, I said, God, may our worship be a sweet-smelling aroma in your nostril. That's what I said in my prayer at church. Well, that next morning, Monday morning, Anthony is praying. And he said the same exact thing. May our worship be a sweet-smelling aroma in your nostril. And I couldn't help it, but I busted out laughing uh, in middle prayer, okay? And I asked him, I said, son, why would you, why would you pray that? What, what are you praying? He said, dad, you said that yesterday when you prayed. 
And it dawned on me, you know what? He's right. And at that point, I realized, you know, it doesn't matter how many people they hear pray. If they're going to learn to pray, they're going to have to learn to pray from me. Your kids are watching you, dads. They're watching you. Let them see you praising God. Let them see God raised to the highest place of your life. Number two, the second piece of advice I want to give you is uh, know what your kids are doing. Know what your kids are doing. I know that's difficult when they become of adult age. So this may be speaking more um, to the young fathers. But, hey, if you have kids who have kids, you might want to give them this piece of advice, okay? You can still be a father as they father. Or you can be a mother as they father, okay? Know what your kids are doing. Look at verse 22. Now Eli was very old, and he heard, Keyword heard everything his sons did to all of Israel and how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. His sons were evil and he heard about it. He didn't know what they were doing. Eli heard what his children were doing. It's hard as a parent to hear from someone else that your child uh, is not being good or being flat out evil. You see... My kids, and I'll just use them as an example. They don't always do what's right. They know that. I know that. I don't always do what's right, so I'm not throwing them under the bus. But there was a lot of times where there were several times where I showed up places that they thought I didn't know where they were, but because there was conversations, I knew exactly where they were. Listen, I wanted to know where my kids were, and it scared them to death when I showed up at a place that he wasn't supposed to be, and I didn't think they thought I didn't know they were there. You follow that? You got to know where your kids are. You got to know what your kids are doing. All right? Know what they, where they are, what they're doing. Now, I know we can't be with them everywhere, every second of the day, but we can know, we can know who they're with and what they do. Dads, don't be too busy. Don't be too busy with other tasks to take time with your kids. Don't be too busy. Be involved as a parent. And that doesn't change no matter what age they are. Be involved as a parent. The only way we can know what our kids are doing, where they are, where they're going, is to communicate, is to talk. There should be an open line of communication between parents and children. See, in society today, there's a breakdown in communication. And one of the best places for communication within the family is at the dinner table. You've heard this said, I'm sure, a million times. James Dobson is a big proponent of sitting down and having dinner together. And it's not because of food. It's because of communication. It's so that you can talk about what is going on in each other's life. Fathers, we need to be communicating. We need to be involved with our children as often as we can. Matter of fact, I had somebody to tell me, or actually I overheard a conversation who told a father-to-be that um, he did not have to be around until the child was a couple of years old. Oh, that kid don't need you until you're, until, you know, three, four, or five years old. Once it's potty trained, then you can step in and do your thing. See, that's the mentality of the world. You know, fathers don't have to be around. Just certain times. Listen, fathers, uh, we need to be there from birth through adulthood. Actively communicating and sharing with our children. Listen, don't put that responsibility on your children to have that relationship with you. Don't put that responsibility on your children. You're the father. You lead by example. Know what your kids are doing. Have that open line of communication. Number three, the third piece of advice I want to give you, and we see from Eli's example, is uh, restrain your kids from evil. Restrain your kids from from evil. Look at verse 13 of chapter 3. So we're going over a little bit. Verse 13, chapter 3. It says, For I have told them that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vile and he did not restrain them. You know what that means? That means he didn't discipline them. 
He didn't discipline them. If there's something missing in houses today, in homes today, it's discipline. And I'm not talking about spanking necessarily. I'm not talking about that. Although that is a part of discipline of which I experienced and which I gave out. So I'm not, you know, saying anything about that. But what we have to do, the piece of advice that we see that Eli didn't do, is restrain our kids from evil. See, restrain means uh, to control or to keep from or to discipline. See, it's our obligation as fathers, all right? And this is part of discipline. Like I said, it's not about uh, punishment, all right? Discipline is this as well. It's our obligation as fathers to filter what flows through the life of our children. It's our jobs as father to filter what flows through the life of our children, what we allow them to see, what we allow them to be exposed to. All right, what, what, what they see and what they're exposed to will make them who they are. The Bible says, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What they put in their life, what they put in their heart, will overflow. We were probably pretty strict as parents. I mean, to hear my kids talk to other people about what we didn't let them watch and what we didn't let them see and what we didn't let them listen to is kind of comical now. But I don't regret it. I don't regret it one bit. Restrain your kids from evil. Look at Eli here. He did not do what it took to keep his boys from doing wrong. We do see him scold them, right? We do see him sit them down and say, hey, God's going to punish you for this behavior. But they didn't listen to Eli because Eli didn't do nothing. He didn't lay that foundation of discipline. See, it starts when they're young. It starts when they're young. You must have a standard, all right? You must have a standard that your children know. You must stick with it. You must not compromise your convictions. Let's face it. Children are drawn to evil. They're drawn to evil. We're drawn to evil. It's the very nature of man. And if we do not protect them or restrain them, then we're basically pushing them into the hands of Satan. We talk about discipline and, and you know, uh, censorship. I'm not going to allow that in my home. I'm going to allow that. I want them to see. I want them to be exposed. All you're doing is pushing them into the hands of Satan by exposing them to all of that is it out there. Parents, you need to sit down together. Mom, Dad, sit down together. Decide what you will and what you will not allow in your home. And then you must communicate it to your children plainly and clearly. The fourth piece and final piece of advice I want to share with you this morning before we close is make a positive difference for generations to come. Make a positive difference for generations to come. Look at verse 33 of chapter 2. It says, By any of your men, but any of your men whom I do not cut off from my altar shall consume your eyes and grieve your heart, and all the descendants of your house shall die in the flower of their age. Whether the difference is good or bad, the decisions you make now will follow down the next generations. The decisions you make now will follow down to the next generations. Eli was cut off by God for his lack of discipline in his sons. Don't make the same mistakes Eli made. Because it doesn't stop with your children. And it doesn't just stop with their children. Look at verse 17 as we begin to wrap this up. Therefore the sin of chapter 2, 17 of chapter 2, therefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. And so here you have Eli's sons and their conduct and the way they acted. And it didn't just hurt Eli's generation, but it caused the nation of Israel to abhor, to hate the sacrifices of God. They hated to come to the tabernacle. They hated to come and offer their uh, sacrifices. They didn't want to come to worship because of Eli's sons. Fathers and mothers, we need to raise our children in a way where they can make a positive difference in the lives of the people they come in contact with, especially their families, especially their families and generations to come. 
See, one of the greatest mistakes Eli made was his boys never knew God. They may have been priests, but they never knew God. You may come to church, but that doesn't mean you know God. You may call yourself a Christian, but that doesn't mean you know God. You may have godly parents, but that doesn't mean you know God. Fathers above all, mothers too, grandparents as well, aunts and uncles above all, we need to introduce our children to Christ. We need to introduce our children to Christ. We need to be sharing and modeling His love and sacrifice. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Christ. And you've never repented of your sins. Then I want you to come to your Heavenly Father this morning. He loves you. He desires a relationship with you. Won't you come? I know that this was a Father's Day message. You may be going something in your life right now that no one seems to be able to help you with. You can't get any guidance from any person around. Maybe you need to come to your Heavenly Father. Maybe you just need to come and let Him know what you're going through. Maybe you just need to come and give it to Him. You know, Peter writes about casting our burdens upon Him for He cares for us. Whatever your need is, God will meet with you today.